Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Gabor Lukacs. I'm the president of Air Passenger Rights, and this is our Sunday update, Air Passenger I hope you had a good week. We're going to start momentarily. I'm just going to get uh, the thumbs up from uh, my team to see that uh, everything is rolling. So I'm waiting to just a few thumbs up to see that you have tuned in, that you are able to hear me, you are able to see me. Um, and uh, I already see some comments telling me that I can be heard and seen clearly. So let's just wait a little bit more. I know that people don't always uh, Tune in right on the dot. We are uh, hi Coney. Welcome back. Uh, probably we are going to give it another minute. Hi Fatima. Hi Marion. And uh, it's one of the things that you develop when you teach at university. That of course uh, there is an official start time. Sometimes people are late, and you try to accommodate. It. Hi Chris. Hi Andrea. Hi Becky, hi Kirsten, hi Sheena, uh, hi my Marco. I guess you will see also from this how much lag there is between the time you type and the time that uh, hi Kevin and the time that uh, I'm responding. I think we are all great, so we should start. We are right now at around uh, uh, seventy-four people watching. Hopefully people will be joining us. Well, now we're up to 80 actually. So uh, let's start. And as always, I am very, very grateful to our volunteers, uh, Martin, Dominic, uh, Christine, and Terry, who have been helping me again through this week. This has been a very, very busy week. Uh, and uh, we are here again on a Sunday looking for some updates, um, some uh, good news, bad news. So we are going to go through everything uh, all as usual. I just want to mention again, I'm sure I mentioned many, many times that if you are not following yet our Twitter feed, please do that. I just put out a, a tweet there a couple of minutes before start about some uh, news that have been happening. And, uh, and uh, we are, we are uh, as we can, as you will see from that tweet, which I'm going to address as well, there are people in the industry who are not happy with us, who don't want the public to hear our message. And so it is very important that you do your part in disseminating the facts, the truth about the rights of passengers and uh, visit our uh, Twitter feed, subscribe to it and retweet things to share with as many people as possible. Um, we are going to talk also about chargebacks, don't worry. Uh, we it is on the agenda. I just would like to go through some of the some of the uh, items first. Uh, perhaps the, the uh, most important I item to go through would be uh, the statement on vouchers, if which I will have to uh, go to it. So as you know, our reply in that proceeding in the Federal Court of Appeal was due uh, last this past Thursday. So we are going to uh, look into just the main ideas of what we have been uh, talking about. And switch viewer, there we go. And uh, it, it is a bombastic uh, 1000 page document, but uh, the parts that we really need to read are only the first 20 pages or so. And even there, uh, we are going to just skim through things. It isn't, the purpose here is not to uh, go into uh, great uh, legal details. This is not a, a law class after all, but just, just to point out a few items of interest and, uh, and um, see what sense we can make of it. So uh, this is um, submitted by Simon Lin of our group. And uh, we are very fortunate to have him on board this case. Um, so as typical, um, we start with a reply, a reply with an overview, 
where we are drawing attention to the most important points that we are dealing with right here. The Canadian Transportation Agency has been acting unlawfully, misguiding passengers into swallowing vouchers instead of demanding cash refunds, while benefiting, airline, benefiting airlines with billions of interest loans. Uh, that's a beautiful prose by uh, Simon. Um, we are right away uh, jumping into, uh, well, pointing out that the agency has been misquoting what we were saying, uh, and the agency admitted uh, that the statement, statement on vouchers, widely disseminated, and that there is uncontradicted evidence that there was confusion arising. Um, we are also pointing out that a regular Canadian cannot be expected to lawyer up. So basically, if the Canadian Transportation Agency is putting out there some information, and that information is misleading and wrong, as it is here, then it is inevitable that the public will rely on it. And that's an important aspect for harm that we are trying to prevent here. We are getting here both into some substantive and legal technicalities because, as you know, the agency put out the FAQ, but the FAQ does not really resolve the confusion and the misinformation that was created by the statement on vouchers. Uh, so we are addressing that both from a legal perspective with the principle that ex post facto evidence cannot be used, and also from the practical sense that there is no evidence that people who have seen the statement on vouchers would also be seeing the FAQ. So uh, we are flagging it to the court then that the agency is lacking any evidence for most of what they are saying. They submitted an affidavit by uh, paralegal that they have, which does not really uh, help. And, and moreover, this was a person who, who uh, was not cross-examined. Most importantly, uh, we don't have any evidence about the authorship approval and the purpose of the statement and we are asking the court to draw an adverse inference uh, from uh, those omissions. So adverse inference is a principle that if a party has evidence in their control and they then don't provide that evidence, then the court should assume that the, the evidence would have been adverse to, to the party's interest. And we are picking apart in the agency's arguments um, about uh, the, the agency claims that the statement is a prudent policy, uh, that it is uh, not subject to judicial review, and it cannot give to reasonable apprehension of bias. And that anyway, this is a more legal technicality that uh, we don't meet the criteria for a mandamus and a mandatory injunction not available. This, this is just lawyering. I'm going to skip that for your benefit. Uh, our position, and our main thing that is that the agency's job is to carry out policies of parliament, not to make them. Protecting airlines is not the job of the agency. Parliament explicitly assigned to cabinet issuing policies and extraordinary disruption. And we also found out that in 2017, parliament removed economic viability considerations from the agency's mandate. So basically, the agency is straying here into an area which is none of their business. It's not to say that if the airlines need help, they have no place to go. They can lobby the government, and they're welcome to do so. And the government then has to deal with the issue and has to also assume political and legal responsibility for the action. We're also uh, pointing out that uh, the policy statements of judicial of statutory bodies have to conform to the law, and as such, they are subject to judicial review. And uh, Simon found this amazing line of authorities uh, following an Ontario securities case that confirm that policies may give rise to reasonable apprehension of bias. So um, the, uh, whatever the Canadian Transportation Agency was trying to argue that it cannot give rise to reasonable apprehension of bias, our position is that that's really devoid of any merit. We are also correcting here, we were referring here to the Supreme Court of Canada case, that indeed mandatory injunctions are available. So um, the agent, we, are, we are now picking apart in great detail what the agency said. They are trying to say that because this policy statement, somehow uh, it is immune to judicial review. 
and that's not the law. So we are explaining that uh, the, the fundamental principle is that uh, even policy guidance has to meet some fundamental requirements. It has to conform to the law. And that the statement fails to meet these requirements because policies to protect the airline's economic viability uh, in extraordinary circumstances is beyond the agency's mandate. And the publications were posted in contravention of the agency's own code of conduct. And the publications advocate against both applying the letter and the spirit of law. So this is the essence of what we are putting forward here. Uh, we explain why the agency has no mandate in uh, protecting the airlines. It was a nice find that uh, actually uh, in 2017, uh, Parliament reformed the Canada Transportation Act and removed from the act reference to economic viability of transportation. So when Parliament makes a change to legislation, that has to indicate some intent to change effect. We are also uh, uh, pointing out that um, the code of conduct applies even to those kind of policy statement. Uh, they, they are saying that because it's policy statement, well, that's not really us. We, are, we don't have to abide by by those um, rules, but we are saying, yes, you do have to abide. Um, we are also arguing that the publications are contrary to the law. So we, we are explaining here that uh, even under the APPR, if the cancellation is within the airline's control or it is due to safety issues and within their control, then they have to provide refunds. And the publications suggest that even in those situations, we only get vouchers. And then we go on to uh, remind the court about uh, the air transportation regulation and the existing case law. By Our next section is very, very, very technical, and it relates to the fact that, that um, the, um, about what can be reviewed by the court. So, for example, if the agency put out a, a statement that the sky is beautiful, that's probably would be uh, not reviewable based on the substance. One could still maybe review it based on the fact that commenting on the, on the color of the sky is not part of the agent mandate. So this question of what can and cannot be reviewed by the federal court has been a debate for decades ago. And uh, we, are, we are pointing that out that this debate was uh, settled more than uh, two decades ago. And the court should not allow the agency to reopen this debate on this motion. So the agency is essentially trying to re-argue things that have been uh, decided by the courts many, many years ago. Um, the, the agency also somehow tries to argue that there is no prejudice from the statement um, to passengers. And we are explaining here that there is a direct effect and prejudice for passengers. After all, all of you have seen it about the passengers who try to get chargebacks, who try to go get um, insurance claims and uh, are facing those bogus statements by the Canadian Transportation Agency by, by the airlines. So um, we, have, we are dealing with that as well. And uh, then we address clearly the point that the court has jurisdiction to issue an injunction and that the, the court can uh, restrain members from dealing with refund complaints. One of, the, one of the things we would like is an injunction to uh, prevent those members and the agency who has been participating in issuing such a misleading statement from then deciding complaints about refunds, even that they have already made up their minds about it. So we cite case law on that point as well. Uh, and then we switch gears to talk about the need for an urgent in judicial intervention. Um, I'm thinking what probably is the most important point here for non-lawyers. Um, uh, a number of you mentioned that there's deafening science from the government and we are pointing that out. The complete silence in the affidavit is baffling. The agency was supposed to put forward their best foot in such a situation and yet they are not doing anything. They are just trying to, to be silent on most. 
Uh, in terms of the uh, FAQ, we are pointing out a timeline, something that may not be otherwise clear to the court, that this was uh, published two weeks after the agency was served with our motion materials. So it is something that was created in response and after our motion and not genuinely part of the issue we are addressing before the court. We are also going to some legal technicalities here about smacks of bootstrapping. Bootstrapping is basically a situation where an administrative decision maker tries to generate evidence, tries to, after they made a bad decision, tries to explain it away and create some additional explanations one way or another to avoid uh, the consequence of a judicial review to, to kind of kind of augment, uh, supplement their decision with reasons or with facts to tell the court, well, actually, this was a good decision, don't interfere with that. So that's what we are talking about here. Um, and uh, the, we, the agency cited some other cases where they issued some policy, policy guidances. But in all of those cases, there was a clear disclaimer they were true economic regulations matters, uh, and they did not involve interjecting into a live controversy between, the, between opposite parties or suggesting uh, undermining the law as an appropriate approach. And so uh, we also then discussed the irreparable harm, which I'm, I don't think I need to explain it to you very much. Um, and the aspect that people have the right to uh, be heard by independent decision maker, which partial one, which doesn't happen here. Um, and um, then we address the balance of convenience aspect that the agency has no stake in it. The agency would not be inconvenienced by having to uh, remove uh, the, the statement. Uh, it is the main issue is that the it's only the airlines that hope to maintain the publication to deter passengers from refund demand, as evident from NACC's attempt to intervene. So let's remember that uh, last week, the National Airline Council of Canada attempted to butt in into this, court, this uh, um, court proceeding. They sought leave to intervene and they were dismissed. They were unsuccessful. So that's what we are mentioning here. And uh we are also pointing out that the agency is telling people that oh well if passengers are not happy with what we are going to do with the complaints then they can go to the federal court of appeal and we are saying that it would be fine and dandy but it would result in hopelessly flooding the court with similar imperative leave to appeal applications and appeals and that that would not be needed i mean after all Average passengers should not have to be forced to go all the way to the Federal Court of Appeal just because the agency decided to um, decide basically with their rights and act mandate on they were required to do. We are, we are still asking the court to expedite the proceedings. Uh, we are dealing here with a few issue, procedural issues. So that's the whole reply. Uh, it goes without saying that the reply is available on our documents website and docs.airpassengerize.ca and you're welcome to study it in greater detail. But I think that this is probably all the uh, legalese that I would like to go into uh, today. Um, so uh, I think if there, I'm wondering if there are any questions so far about the, uh, the legal matters, but if not, uh, then I am inclined to go on to our next item, which we have an unexpected item on our agenda, and that relates to uh, well, it relates to Pax News. The Pax Media um, in uh, approached me a while ago, about a week ago, and they wanted to uh, have a big debate. Uh, with an airline lawyer on the other side uh, to argue about um, whether 
refunds or vouchers are good, whether it's legal. And so they ad were advertising this debate. This debate was supposed to take place uh, this uh, coming Tuesday. So that was, and I'm stressing, it was supposed to take place. But then I received a phone call last night. And they told me that the debate is not going to take place. And the reason it will not take place is because the airlines were, or the people from the travel industry more precisely, were contacting them and were, there was lots of backlash, lots of uh, objection to uh, the debate, but lots of objection to uh, me um, participating in it, apparently, and therefore they decided to cancel it. I have uh, already posted on uh, Twitter a tweet about this issue, and uh, I'm going to also paste its uh, link to here. Uh, I, would, I would invite all of you um, to retweet, to uh, uh, perhaps tell uh, Pax News what you think about this, uh, whether, what, uh, uh, how you feel about this. So I've just posted a link to, to the um, actual um, tweet. And, and I, I would very, very much encourage uh, everyone to, um, to take action about this uh, because it's quite clear that, which what we knew already, that there are many people who want to silence us, who want to prevent us from and uh, actually voicing legitimate concerns, legitimate complaints about how passengers are. I was asked, meanwhile, a question, and, I, and I'm going to come back to it right away. I was asked when the Federal Court of Appeal is going to make its decision. And of course, that's a, that's a question that judges will tell you as soon as possible. Uh, what we are dealing with right now is an interim or interlocutory uh, injunction. That's an interim order. That's a temporary order, not something permanent yet. What we are asking right now the court to do is that because this is something urgent, this is something that's causing harm to people all the time, this should be dealt with soon and uh, that while the matter is being heard until a three-judge panel can render a final decision on the case, we would like the court to have an order in place to require the agency to take off um, the uh, state minimum vouchers uh, and to clarify to everyone who was said by it that this is not a legally binding document, that it is not uh, uh, in any way any, any kind of official document. Uh, this, that's, that's the underlying purpose. And so, um, in in the, in the, in terms of uh, the timelines, uh, the what what I do know that it is already, as far as I understand, with a judge, and it was sent to the judge right away as soon as it was submitted. And uh, well, I don't know how long it will take to his lordship or her ladyship to uh, review all the documents. It's obviously very very voluminous. Um, of course, we are hoping for as soon as possible. You know, maybe Monday maybe Tuesday, maybe end of this coming uh, week, longer. I, we don't know that. And judges are always concerned about not just getting things done, but doing the right, making, getting it right. And so from that perspective, uh, how long it takes, it, judges are aware of their acting accordingly. Um, I'm... I'm wondering if there are any other questions so far. Um, look at my little agenda, yes. Um, so um, in terms of uh, the class action, I think we have two news items on the list. I promised to give you a class action update. One of them is a quite um, simple one. Let me just find a document. Uh, 
Okay, so I think I have the document now. Let me just pull it up. Uh, so the latest update that we have on the class actions um, Okay, so the latest update is a direction from Friday uh, in the class action. Uh, and the direction, uh, I'm going to make it a bit bigger so that you will be able to see. So this is the class action uh, in the federal court, just to be clear. This is in the federal court. And this direction was issued on May 8th, that's on Friday. Uh, and th there are two things, it, uh, it's issued by Prothonotary Ring. Prothonotaries are used to be called associate judges. They are um, judiciary decision makers who help run cases and help. They can deal with many, many things that judges can, not with everything, but in a big class action, this case, they appointed both a protonotary and the judge to run the case. Uh, and the good news is that uh, they also asked the plaintiff to submit in consultation with the defendant the dates and times of availability for a case management conference. So case management conference is, um, is, a, is a basically a place where uh, with the, the protonotary or a judge, uh, the parties agree on timelines. You need to think of it a bit like when you have a all days a duel and they agree what kind of guns you're going to use and from what distance you're going to shoot at each other. Something similar to that, but way more peaceful. You just basically agree on timelines. And, uh, and um, of course, defendants typically push back. They want to have as generous timelines as, as, as you, they can get, while plaintiffs typically want as tight timelines as they can, they can master. So uh, it, it's one of those, uh, one of those um, um, interesting situations that, that um, lawyers handle among each other. And I'm going now to switch back to answering questions. So uh, Pat Aguirre was asking, what are the consequences of a CT not making themselves available at the hearing recently as a no-show in regards to the course dealing with a no-show? So, Pat, um, the agency was a no-show at the cross-examination. Cross-examination is where our counsel would have been able to ask questions from the agency's affiant and would have been able to also ask the agency's affiant to produce documents. Uh, in terms of the consequences, those are being dealt with uh, in our reply. We, are, uh, we mentioned it just very briefly that in such situations, normally the procedure would be to strike out the affidavit. But in this case, what we are asking the court, because we are going to proceed very quickly, is that the court simply uh, draw an adverse inference from conduct. The court, we are inviting the court to conclude that the reason that uh, the cross-examination was a no-show uh, is because the agency expected that the answer to the question that was asked would have been harming their case. That's what adverse inference means. Uh, Maria is asking, what is a case management conference? So a case management conference, this is a situation where the parties meet with the judge or for the notary uh, to decide procedures, to decide timelines. Um, it, it is a procedural matter. It's a way to, you know, when the court rules provide timelines for many, but in practice, it's often difficult because the case is complex, because there is lots of evidence, because lawyers may be very busy. So uh, case conferences where parties, with the help of a judge, and ultimately the court sets the timelines, but they, they decide on some timelines, normally, normally it's purpose. Uh, Chris Duffy was asking also, uh, is the best case scenario uh, with the Federal Court of Appeal a ruling for the state on vouchers to be taken down? Has anything else been asked? So Chris, in, in the uh, Federal Court of Appeal, what we are asking, and we can pull up the exact notice of application, is that it, the statement be taken down, uh, that there will be a declaration by the court that it is, has no force of law, it's, it's no legal effect. and uh, that the Canadian Transportation Agency 
be uh, basically uh, prevented from adjudicating those refund complaints and therefore engage in uh, biased decision making. So that way, uh, the, the, they, they will not be able to taint the proceeding, taint the process with their uh, quite problematic behavior. This case is not going to uh, issue some kind of final decision. Yes, everybody is entitled to a refund. That's not the issue today on this case before the court. But it is important that, first of all, the misinformation be brought to a halt. It is not going to be that kind of uh, you know, movie like Victory with a flag in the background, and and uh, even the best case scenario is not going to be anything like that. Uh, the way you need to think generally of what happens in most court proceedings is imagine scale, scales of justice, and the judge is going to say, well, one side is just a little bit heavier than the other. That's typically what you find in most judgments. Judges are aware of the responsibility they have and that they have to uh, be careful with what they are saying. And I don't expect that, that I don't expect any kind of bombastic uh, judgment to come out because that's not how judges talk. That, that happens only in movies. What, what I hoping for is a very precise legal analysis of the issue and a finding by the court that the agency has been acting, that the agency has been stepping outside of their map. They have been trying to help airlines with their cash flows instead of passengers. That's really, really the focus. And that uh, the agency has to take down the statement, has to inform everybody who was misinformed that this is no longer uh, on the, online. It is correct uh, to, to essentially rectify in some way. And that's something that the, that the court and possibly lawyers will work out with the exact wording of the order. But the, the bottom line is to fix the situation. That's, that's really, this statement created an enorm enormous amount of damage, enormous amount of harm to the public. And somehow uh, we need to do our best to fix it. The agency has to. That's really. Um, and Kevin, Kevin, I, I, you're describing it as a, describing it as a small, uh, a, a small battle in a big war. I would say uh, it would be it would be a very important uh, step in the right direction. But we also need to bear in mind that what we have now is just a temporary. Whether we win or lose. The case will be heard, the merits of the case will be heard by a three panel court. This now is heard by a single judge, but the merits of the case will be heard by a three panel court at a later date. And right now, we are just dealing with the current situation about a quick ramp. Um, I'm looking here now again at uh, Path's question. Given that certain press media are now presenting as fact a CT in proper legal position, uh, for example, David Olive Toronto Star reference, uh, to the same first statement of the CT, what action is intended to deal with that? Well, uh, in terms of, in terms of uh, the Toronto Star uh, editorial that was published yesterday, it was very, very unfortunate. And I would hope that it, they don't intend it to be uh, the new norm of publishing misinformation. I would be surprised if it was the intent. Uh, I've already sent a letter to Mr. Olive. I've copied it to the um, public editor. I am aware that some of you may have also sent letters to Mr. Olive and also to her. Um, we will. The public editor will hopefully get back to us. To, uh, and uh, I would hope that misstatements will be corrected. It would be very. It would be a tragedy if the public could not rely on accurate and, and fact reporting from. Um, I'm I, I'm seeing here one question that I'm going to just jump into, and then probably we should talk about um, charge vex. Before that, we should mention also that uh, 
nothing to do with the first question, another class action comment, and then talk about chargebacks. So Chris is asking, uh, the airline hasn't used the word canceled and only has changed the itinerary uh, and are trying to force you into canceling your trip. Uh, basically, uh, the language the airline uses doesn't matter. What matters is, has the number of your flight changed? If you had flight 123 and that's no longer operating and you have flight 321 instead, then the original flight was canceled. That's, that's quite uh, clear then, I believe. Um, in terms of the uh, situation uh, with airlines trying to force you into, into canceling, uh, yes, that has been an ongoing. We have had that problem going on. And the main thing is don't let them do it. Do your very best to resist uh, those attempts. They are simply trying to fool you into uh, canceling. And then they can say, well, it was you who canceled. You the passenger. It wasn't us who canceled your flight. So uh, in such situations, I would simply decline uh, the schedule change, decline the flight change, and advise the airline that if it's really a different flight number, your flight has been canceled. And quite clear in the current situation, the reason for the cancellation is economic. It's not because there is any kind of government rule prohibiting them from flying. Indeed, the fact that they are offering a flight a couple hours later shows that they are available and capable of flying and there is no government problem. And if they refuse to refund the money, then it's charged back on the basis that the merchant refuses to comply with the terms and conditions. The provisions of their passenger protection regulations are now incorporated as a bare minimum in all contracts. So uh, you can certainly rely on it. It was a cancellation for within their control. Uh, therefore, you have the right to it's black letter. Um, I'm I'm hearing I'm hearing here uh, comments about problems with the uh, audio. Uh, I'm wondering if there is still an issue or that the issue has been resolved. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I'm going to. I'm I hope that it's going to be resolved now, uh, but. Uh, if the problems with the audio continue, just I will ask that my team let me know. Uh, it may be something to do with the load on my computer, uh, but hopefully it's going to be resolved. Um, I'm seeing here um, more questions. Question by Frank. Would the court be likely to clarify the law that refunds are required, as regulators have said in other jurisdictions? Um, courts... Uh, we'll be looking at things as narrowly as possible. Courts are not in the business of uh, trying to pronounce judgments on issues that they don't absolutely have to and require in order to um, um, resolve the issues. So it may well happen that the court is going to say that um, all they need to know to deal with the issue is that the agency was acting out of the mandate. And that's, that's perfectly good. Uh, so Nicola is, is asking, airline told me around our spin that they are canceling flight for my children's safety. Uh, told them I don't agree for vouchers and I want refund. Well, Nicola, very good. Um, I think now probably we should uh, go to talk a little bit about the question of uh, chargebacks. Uh, and, and I hope I didn't miss anybody's question. If I did, I hope that uh, my wonderful team of volunteers are going to tag it for me. Uh, so in terms of chargebacks, we are now seeing cases of uh, airlines pushing back and disputing their chargebacks. There's nothing to be concerned about it. It's normal. We are asserting our rights. We should not expect the airlines to just roll over either. As long as we are not pushbacks, we're not pushovers, and we push back, then um, life goes on. 
the airlines will try to come up with all sorts of uh, absurd explanations as to why you shouldn't be given your money back. And our job is to, in such situations, to write back to the credit card company and give good sound reasoning why the airline's arguments are flawed and why uh, you are actually entitled to a refund or um, airfare that you pay, vacation that you pay. I started a post a while ago where I'm dealing with people who need help uh, and you are welcome. If you receive a notification from your credit card company that your chargeback was declined, the first step is to contact your credit card company and insist that they provide you with all documentation on the basis of which they decline your chargeback. And then you do have a right to submit a rebuttal and have the entire dispute brought to operation either by Visa or MasterCard International. Your credit card issuer is not the place of last resort here, it's just a kind of preliminary stage. Their job is in some ways to collect the information from you, collect the information from the merchant, but it's not the end of the road. So we have already been responding to many of those uh, airline disputes and airlines will make all sorts of absurd claims, including that they cancel your flight due to government prohibition. Also, we do know that in Canada, there was no government prohibition that prevents from flying. There have been advisories, recommendations, but not actual. And we do have documentation of that. So we are submitting those things for all passengers who are facing such situations. Sheena is asking uh, another chargeback question for QBs. Um, I have received a chargeback on my visa. I have taken the money from a credit card and put it in a bank account. Credit card ha has been closed. If the airlines demand money back, how can they get it if, they just, if I just say no? Um, so, of course, uh, you're raising an interesting question. Uh, the credit card company will come back to you and say you actually owe us money. But certainly, having a situation where the money is back into your account and you don't even have a credit card anymore with that company uh, makes it practically a bit more difficult for them to get back the money. But it, the situation is not different than you refusing to pay your credit card balance. So, uh, and for, for, say, a false transaction, I'm not saying to, that you would ever refuse to pay what you owe if it is legitimate charge. But if you have a fraudulent charges, an extreme case on your credit card company, you complain to the credit card and say, this, I didn't authorize this uh, $1,000 diamond on the credit card. I didn't buy that. I wasn't there. I was here in Canada and that charge is from California. And they ignore you. I would just not pay because it's obvious that the credit card company is trying to make you pay for something viable. So in, the, in, in a situation described by Sheena, uh, it makes them perhaps a bit more difficult in practical terms to go after you, but certainly just closing a credit card doesn't mean that you don't have to pay legally if otherwise you owe them money. The point is that you don't owe them money because you didn't receive the services that you were supposed to receive. So if, they, if the airline comes back and, uh, and disputes a chargeback and then they repost it to your account and they try to contact you and say, well, you actually have to pay it, then the first response, Sheena, is, well, before I would pay anything, show me the documents that the airline submitted. And if you don't show those documents to me, if you're, not, if you're not willing to follow the proper procedure for dispute, I won't pay. And they can try to go after you. They can try to put something in your credit record. But then the response is, well, if you put something false on my credit record, something which has no basis, I'm going to sue you for defamation. So don't be just scared about a typical rant by credit card companies, that, oh, we're going to ruin your credit card rating, we are going to do this or that to you, collection and so on. Because in this case, you are disputing the amount. They cannot go after you for a collection unless they have an actual judgment again. They get a judgment, they would have to work very hard if you have been consistently disputing the charges and if there is clear proof that you didn't receive the services. So uh, if you push back hard enough, I suspect that most of those credit cards will realize that the path of least resistance is the airline and not you. Michelle is asking uh, about chargebacks. Two different agents from my bank have told me that I can only claim for that after the date of my flight, June 24th, even though the flights are canceled. 
This is a bit uh, tricky. Um, I would say that uh, initiating a chargeback after the day of your flight passes is, is really the kind of the, the foolproof way of doing it. Because then there's no possibility that the airline in the last minute will come up with a different itinerary, will, will say, oh, we are going to transport you via these three cities to your destination and somehow weasel out of it. So it's certainly the, the most, uh, most efficient way. And perhaps that's why they wanted to do it that way. Um, technically, if there's a clear repudiation, clear statement from the airline, we are not providing the services, you have every right on earth to, uh, to um, initiate a chargeback. Uh, it's a question of how much you want to fight over that specific point with your credit card company. It's, it's a question of personal taste. I would certainly record a credit card company and document that they confirm to you that after the date of your flight, you will be able to pursue your chargeback. So you will not lose your right for somehow for a chargeback. For Another question uh, by Helen. Uh, if you say Canada has no government prohibitions regarding flights to other countries, then are all the flights canceled purely for economic reasons? The vast majority of the flights are canceled for economic reasons. Indeed, that's true. Um, most passengers would possibly not be able to enter the destination country. So, for example, uh, I'm a Hungarian citizen. A flight from Toronto to Budapest, I would be able to board because I have a Hungarian passport. Uh, and so I would be able to uh, show to the airline that once I arrive in Hungary, I would have to be allowed into the country, even though I'm coming from a different country. But for an average Canadian who is only a Canadian citizen, they would not be able to board a flight, and therefore the aircraft would be flying empty. And that's something that they were discussing in the past in, but in the context of European rules, that they closed flights that they were operating just for the sake of maintaining slots their takeoff starts in a different context. But uh, that's what they are prone to prevent because it's really wasteful. Um, so from, from an economic perspective, I'm certainly in agreement with the airlines canceling those flights. There's nothing wrong with it. The problem is that they are not refined. The, the, uh, the other aspect is that if you're not able to travel because of those government post rules, not on flying, but on citizens of other countries, preventing them from entering, then uh, you can also have a case against the airline for uh, frustration of contract type of refund. So frustration of contract is a legal principle when it becomes impossible to carry out a contract for circumstances uh, outside uh, both parties' control, which was seen and foreseeable, then uh, the parties can kind of part ways and... Uh, as if the contract had never existed. So the amounts paid goes back to the buyer or payer, and the other party is uh, off the hook from the obligation. The airlines probably are aware of that. So they also cancel because uh, it's probably cheaper to not operate a flight and eventually refund passengers, and operate a flight, and still have to refund. I, I suspect, I don't know, but I my if. Of course, I would like to be, love to be a fly on the wall of some of the boardrooms of those. Areas. I suspect that they have good enough lawyers who will tell them that sooner or later they will have to passenger, just a matter of time. Um, in England, in, in, in the UK, they have already CAA, uh, the Civil Aviation Authority of the UK, has already issued you know, a stark warning to airlines and that they have to issue refunds. And uh, I suspect, I hope that they are going to also follow up on that, take action. This is somewhat similar to uh, what the US Department of Transport issued, issued all the term. Uh, but it seems to be abundantly clear to anyone that, that you cannot, uh, airlines cannot just do away with the basic rules of gap, which is based on the private property uh, being you know, sanctity of the, I guess you can say sanctity of private property that you cannot just go out and take away someone else's private property because sure there are people who need food who need houses who need many things 
car just because I need a car quote I cannot go over to my garage and uh, take his car and say well I stole it but actually I needed it that's not how our society works uh, perhaps we can have a different society a principle different laws different social consensus where uh, people share various uh, goods uh, based on the need they have and someone will decide what their needs are. Uh, there have been such attempts for that in history. At least uh, they weren't exactly working. I'm not saying that they are morally wrong. I'm saying that, unfortunately, they weren't exactly working. One thing is clear that the principle that rich people can pocket the money of uh, average Canadians, uh, those wealthy corporations can steal your money just because they need it for their survival, is a very dangerous argument because, argument because it cuts both ways. Very... Quickly, you may have infuriated mob of people who have been laid off and uh, uh, hungry and going into the uh, nicer parts of the town because they need food. And quite frankly, that need for food is quite more uh, real and immediate than perhaps Air Canada's need. Uh, Pat is asking, I initiated a chargeback three weeks ago with RBC Visa. I noticed credit from Sunwing on Friday, not full amount. Mine is the deposit, uh, $500. Well, Pat, I think that perhaps Sunwing is trying to play some kind of hedge game, trying to say, well, we're going to refund this, but not the other part. They're trying to make up some kind of explanations to what they're doing. Um, I would just say, relax, pursue your chargeback, pursue uh, your rights. And obviously, you shouldn't be double dipping. So if for some reason they refunded a portion of your of your uh, what you paid uh, and the remaining amount uh, in the full amount is then again uh, charged back to you then eventually you will have to clear it up with your credit card company that you should not be getting by the end of the day more in total than uh, what you're just be careful about and is asking if the voucher is refused what is we uh, which is what I've done when the voucher does expire because not convenient for me to go. Can I still continue to get my money back? Um, well, refusing the voucher is the most important step to be able to enforce your rights through a chargeback. Uh, one of the things that airlines like to tell you and tell the credit card company is that this person is not owed a chargeback because they accepted the voucher. So making sure and documenting it by way of an audio recording, by way of, of um, other means, uh, email, uh, Facebook chat, that you have been clearly refusing to accept vouchers is very important for your chargeback. Um, we are approaching now, we have passed now 50 minutes. Uh, so uh, there, there is a good question here. Um, by, I would like to be diverging here because uh, I, a good question by uh, Krista Wood uh, Ferreira. Can you explain the difference between an airline reg regulated under federal law and a tour operator regulated under provincial law? Okay, um, that, that's, that's a very, very complicated jurisdictional question. It, it goes back to uh, how airlines and various uh, businesses are, are regulated uh, under our constitution. Uh, I remember many, many years ago, I had this very thick book on the Constitutional Law of Canada by uh, Professor Hogg from, he was a uh, uh, expert on, on uh, constitutional law. And that explains this issue of divided between uh, provincial and federal jurisdiction. Historically, there is a case from about 100 years ago, still coming down from the, from the uh, Privy Council, uh, which uh, was way before the, 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 the uh, repatriation of the Constitution. So in those days, um, actually, the UK Privy Council was the court of last resort for Canadians. And that decision was that airlines, aeronautics are federally regulated. And therefore, airlines today are regulated by federal law, by um, the Canadian Transportation Agency, the Transport Canada. When it comes to tour operators, uh, they are, uh, there seems to be a consensus that they are falling under provincial uh, jurisdiction dominantly. But 
uh, it doesn't mean that airlines are not subject to some provincial laws. They are. Um, one of them is, of course, the Consumer Protection Act, uh, which is a statute of general applicability. So uh, it's, it's a, it's a, what we are talking about, Krista, is, a, is really a constitutional law minefield. Um, and uh, there are notions like interjurisdictional immunity, where, where one branch, so the federal people who are federally regulated can say, no, this provincial law doesn't apply to us because there's a federal um, legislation in place and it's exhaustive. Um, but the general consensus, as I understand it, is that uh, law, a, a, a province, for example, Ontario or Nova Scotia, could not enact its own air passenger bill of rights because airlines are regulated federally. However, if there is a statute of general applicability that applies to all merchants, all vendors, then airlines would also be subject to that uh, to a very great extent. There can be some minor uh, exceptions from that, but uh, that, that would possibly under the most type of situation. Um, even that is not quite settled. Uh, in, For example, in the U.S., I've just seen a case that we said no. State law. The U.S. has a bit of a similar situation. Uh, but in, to answer uh, Krista's question, uh, in terms of uh, chargeback, uh, I don't think that it really affects fundamentally your chargeback rights. The chargeback, if you're in Ontario, Krista, then your chargeback right is not simply a matter of your credit card's policy, but also a matter of Ontario Consumer Protection Act, Section 726.9. And so uh, whether it's the airline or, or, or the tour company, if you didn't receive the services you had paid for, those provisions apply and you are entitled. Um, scrolling here slowly down, um, I see here another question by Karina, chargeback question. Use the travel agency to buy my tickets, but the charge came through as Air Canada. Now that I opened the dispute and got my temporary credit, I'm liking the limbo because of the flights may get resumed, but the Air Canada can challenge or, or not my char or not my chargeback. So um, the uh, the to answer Karina, uh, I would say that if your flight has once been cancelled, then it's dead. You cannot really resurrect it. It has been cancelled. I'm sure you have made changes to your plans accordingly. You took those things into account when you uh, planned your life from that point on. And if the airline says, no, actually we changed our mind, we still operate those flights, that's not good enough. You, th that contract has already been repudiated. It's not like they canceled your flight and offered you a, fl uh, a flight 10 minutes later. They said in most cases, sorry, we are not able to transport you anytime. So um, here's how I would look at it. Option A, the, cans, the flight doesn't get rescheduled, then service is not received. Option B, they somehow reinstate the flight, and they're a different number. Then your flight was cancelled clearly for reasons other than outside the airline's control. If the airline can switch you know, back and forth the flights, then quite clearly they are doing it for economic reasons and not because there is some kind of objective factor outside their control. So I would use that against the airline to in the charge process. Um, I, I also see here a comment by uh, Simon Sear. I hope I'm pronouncing Simon's name correctly. Uh, and it's quite correct. The Supreme Court agreed that consumers, consumer protection law applies on federally regulated banks. So that's, a, that's an important point to make that consumer protection laws, which are provincial laws, still apply to federally regulated entities on the basis of a statute of general applicability. So what a province cannot do is enact the Passenger Bill of Rights provincially. But what they can do is have a general law, for example, about cards and their expiry, about uh, right to chargebacks, about consequences for merchants that don't comply with some legal obligations, and those would apply to airlines as well. Um, Pat is also saying, I tried, I've tried through many means to try and determine which rules govern Royal Air Morocco and cannot determine it. 
Can you tell me whose rules govern them? Uh, in in the if you cancel flights from Morocco to Montreal. So, uh, Pat, when you have a cancelled flight from Morocco to Montreal, then uh, it is first of all governed by uh, the tariff that they filed with the with the with the Canadian Transportation Agency. Every airline uh, has to file the international tariff, so that would be the first source. But if they cancel your flight and if the flight doesn't operate, then it's a more simple situation. It's a case of services not rendered. So I would suggest that you proceed with a charge book with your credit card. Now, we are, have reached uh, the one hour mark. And I so far don't see a kind of onslaught of questions today. Or perhaps my team has been good at uh, referring people to um, other uh, places in the group. So I'm going to give maybe another uh, minute to see if there's any kind of urgent last minute question. And then probably we should be wrapping up. And I'm sure we still have many, many opportunities to, to see each other and to, uh, to uh, um, discuss things. And um, so uh, I'm just wondering uh, what my team thinks. Uh, um, Dominic and uh, Martin, uh, and any any other urgent question you think I should answer? Um, just let me know. Um, Tammy is asking me here. Uh, my daughter has a return flight booked with Air Canada to Italy in September. She booked with this travel agency. Air Canada is flying to and from Italy, but then the Italian government is not allowing tourists into the country. Tammy, we are talking now about something which is in September. Let's live until then. It's a long time from now. Uh, I, I would not, I won't even want to comment on what happens in September. You know, um, I, I, when I'm talking about those things, what, I, I mean, I, I have a 90 year old grandmother in Hungary. I was supposed to be seeing her this summer. I was supposed now to be. Time. So, um, I, I, I'm not hopeful that we are going to be flying anytime soon. I'm, I'm just... And Frank is asking if I can talk to Force Majeure and a reason to keep our money and how we might respond to that charter problem. You know, Frank, with Force Majeure clauses, the first response is, has that clause actually been disclosed to you? In many cases, I'm seeing um, some uh, airlines producing terms and conditions that is obviously fraudulent in the sense that they have been produced after the time you entered into a contract with them. That's a full response to it. If they have something which they use, they have your physical signature on, then we can talk about it. Even then, it's a question of how force majeure is defined. Generally, force majeure allows the uh, vendor to escape consequences in terms of compensation, indemnity, non-performance. I have not seen any kind of case law that would allow uh, force majeure to just pocket. That's, that's not how the law works. Um, I see here one more question by Marco. Due to current issues, can we cancel flights based on medical issues? Marco, that's a very touchy thing. I, I, don't, th I don't, don't think that that's actually uh, um, possible. Um, if you have a medical issue yourself, it will be more matter for your insurance. Um, I would say that, that, you know, in an ideal world, what we would need is some new legislation that guarantees the right of anybody for the next three months to cancel no question asked. Why? Because I don't want sick people to die. I would want people to get back their money, not simply because it's the right thing or the legal thing, but because it can save lives. People who feel that they have to fly or else they lose their money are more prone to make bad decisions, are more prone to hide their illness, they are more prone to make be irresponsible. So, uh, but as it stands right now, uh, if you are getting sick, I don't think that's a good reason to, to get back your money, other than through your insurance. I've um, seen another question about lack of social distancing on flights. Now, that could be an interesting 
If an airline fails to provide reasonable and required social distancing on board a flight, that's a perfectly good reason to refuse to uh, travel and insist on a full refund because then it is the airline that is breaking the law. They are not acting in a way that allows you to fly. You know, if, if an airline uh, puts five inch uh, uh, nails into, into the uh, airplane seats and you cannot sit down as a result, then they are really not allowing you to benefit of it. Same thing about social distancing. So if you have clear indication that they don't provide proper social distancing on board, that could be a very good basis for a breach of contract type of refund. It may not go necessarily for a chargeback though, but it would be a small claim case that I would be worth pursuing. I am seeing now that the numbers are dropping, so um, the the probably a good time to stop. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for attending today, and of course, again, thank uh, Martin and Dominic, my uh, two moderators today, and the other team members, uh, Christine and Terry, who have been uh, very helpful throughout and uh, who have made all this possible. So. Uh, Thank you very much, and we will see each other next week. Have a good week.